Good evening. Today is Ash Wednesday. It begins our annual remembrance of Christ's suffering and death in the season of Lent. In our midweek services this year, our messages will be arranged under the theme, The Hands of the Passion. Each evening, we will see another player in these last days and last hours of Jesus who has some action, some activity with his hands that applies to what Christ did in order to save us. Tonight, we see the Apostle Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane using his hands to draw his sword and try to defend Jesus to prevent his arrest. And we look at Peter's actions under the theme, Hands of Misguided Zeal. God bless us as we worship tonight. We begin with the opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We begin our worship tonight with a confession of sins. This is a message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins. Father, 
I have sinned against you and am no longer worthy to be called your child. Yet in mercy, you sacrificed your only son, Jesus, to purge away my guilt. For his sake, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And in the joy of the Holy Spirit, let me serve you all my days. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Upon this, your confession, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this day of grace now drawing to a close. Stay with us and warm our hearts with your forgiving love in Christ. May your word keep our faith burning brightly that we may walk in the light of your presence through the darkness of this world. Come and bless us as we worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Passion History reading this evening is entitled Preparations for the Passover and the Upper Room. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. Jesus said to his disciples, You know that after two days it will be the Passover, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. They plotted together how to arrest Jesus in some deceitful way and kill him. But they said, Not during the feast, or else there might be a riot among the people. Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. He went and spoke with the chief priests and officers of the temple guard about how he could betray Jesus to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. He made a promise and was looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus to them when the crowd was not present. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and prepare so that you may eat the Passover? Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and there a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house, the teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. They went and found things just as Jesus had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, Jesus reclined at the table with the twelve apostles. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then a dispute arose among them, about among the disciples, about which of them was considered to be greatest. But he told them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Instead, let the greatest among you become like the youngest, and the one who leads like the one who serves. For who is greater, one who reclines at the table or one who serves? Isn't it the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have remained with me in my trials, and I grant to you a kingdom even as my Father granted to me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And you will sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. By the time the supper took place, the devil had already put the idea into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. So he got up from supper and laid aside his outer garment. He took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, You do not understand what I am doing now, but later you will understand. Peter told him, You will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Lord, not just my feet, Simon Peter replied, but also my hands and my head. 
Jesus told him, A person who has had a bath does not need to wash anything except his feet to be completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who was betraying him. This is why he said, Not all of you are clean. When Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer garment, he reclined at the table again. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord. You are right, because I am. Now, if I, the Lord and the teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Yes, I've given you an example so that you also would do just as I have done for you. Amen, amen, I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. He took a cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this, and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Here ends the Passion History. All we, like sheep, are gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed. We continue with the hymn. Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God for our consideration this Ash Wednesday evening as we begin our season of Lent are words from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 18. I begin reading at verse 4. Then Jesus, knowing everything that was about to happen to him, went out and said to them, who is it that you are seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. I am he, Jesus told them. Judas, who betrayed him, was also standing with them. When Jesus told them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Who is it that you're seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. I told you, I am he, Jesus replied. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This is to fulfill the words he had said, I have not lost one of those you have given me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. At that, Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword away. Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? This is God's word. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it's time to make take matters into my own hands. Maybe you've never said those words just that way before, but you are familiar with the frustration that they express. 
Someone that you're depending upon isn't getting the job done. You've run out of patience with them. Maybe it's someone at work who procrastinates on a project. They avoid the tasks they were given. They, they won't contact the necessary people. It's time to take matters into my own hands. Maybe it's someone you have hired to fix something. Your car, your plumbing, some electrical issue with the house. Their work never solves the problem. You're tired of paying them, but you have to keep taking the car back in or schedule another appointment to meet them at the house. It's time to take matters into my own hands. For Peter, three years of following Jesus had meant watching Jesus' gentle and easy way. Jesus defended his truth against his enemies, it's true, but he didn't seem to be preparing for the literal military battles that were necessary to establish the Messiah's kingdom in Israel. Now his enemies were coming for him with clubs and swords, and Jesus was doing practically nothing but having a little conversation with them. It's time to take matters into my own hands, Peter may have thought. He didn't say those words, but his actions in the Garden of Gethsemane made his intentions loud and clear. Simon Peter wasn't trying to contradict his Lord. He wanted to defend him. But reaching for his sword made his hands hands of misguided zeal. Peter's actions are driven by misguided zeal because Jesus had the power to prevent his arrest. He was giving himself up, and he intended to drink the cup of suffering. You may not know who Edward Bulwer-Lytton was, but you know one of his most famous quotes, The pen is mightier than the sword. Words are often more powerful and more effective than physical force. But with Jesus, this is literally true. Then Jesus, knowing everything that was about to happen to him, went out and said to them, Who is it that you are seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. I am he, Jesus told them. Judas, who betrayed him, was also standing with them. When Jesus told them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Have you ever seen a toddler throw a tantrum in the aisles at Walmart or some other store? They may flail their arms and legs, kicking and even hitting at their parents. Are you ever tempted to intervene to protect mom and dad from the child? Would you if the parents were obviously athletic and muscular? What if you could tell that one of the parents was carrying, that they had a firearm on them? Do you need to step in to protect the parent from an angry two-year-old? The picture of Peter stepping in to defend Jesus from the men who came to arrest him with a few steel blades and wooden clubs is rather pathetic. They had less power against Jesus than the little juvenile in the grocery store aisle pounding on mom or dad's shins with his chubby fists. A word from his mouth. From Jesus' mouth, and they all fell over. It's like the psalmist writes, God lifts his voice, the earth melts, or, or perhaps like Job's words of observation, they perish at a single blast from God and come to an end by the breath of his nostrils. Jesus was holding back. He was showing mercy to the men who had gathered to arrest him. He could have vaporized the entire crowd in an instant. Instead, his words merely pushed them to the ground. He had plenty of power to prevent his arrest. He didn't need Peter's help. Like Peter, we love Jesus. We deplore injustice. The people who reject Jesus, mock his teachings, belittle his importance, attack his followers, or betray and corrupt his faith sometimes make us mad. We're tempted to fight, even to use force to defend our Lord. There is a time for polemics and a place for that. Going on a verbal attack when Christ's teachings 
are being denied or perverted. Even then, we need to police our words so that they don't become abusive. Years later, this same Peter in our lesson wrote that we should defend our faith with gentleness and respect. But nowhere are we called upon to defend our Lord's honor or teaching with physical force. Events from history like the Inquisition or pogroms of the Jews or violent persecution against heretics and unbelievers repeats Peter's sin on an even larger scale. They're committed by hands of misguided zeal. Jesus still does not need us to defend him. He has the power to prevent being mistreated without any help from us. What Peter failed to recognize in this instance was that Jesus was giving himself up. Then he asked them again, Who is it that you are seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. I told you, I am he, Jesus replied. So if you are looking for him, let these men go. This was to fulfill the words he had said, I have not lost one of those you have given me. The time for Jesus' disciples to become martyrs would come, but not like this. Not in a battle that killed some of the very souls Jesus had come to save. Not by standing in the way of the work Jesus came to do. Not before they fulfilled their true purpose, spreading the gospel around the world to people who do not know God's saving love. Jesus was not concerned about his own safety at this moment. He wanted only to secure the safety of the men who had followed him. He had made it clear that he was one of the enemies, he was the one the enemies of his were looking for. I am he, because he fully intended to give himself up. Thus, Jesus makes it clear that he was a willing participant in everything that follows. That does not excuse Judas's betrayal or the evil intent of the Jewish leaders. They were looking only to hurt Jesus and serve themselves. They were unwilling to turn from their hateful plans, but Jesus takes even the sins of his enemies and turns them to serve his loving plans. Jesus' willingness not only to be arrested, but also to endure the hostility and violence against him that steadily grew with each new stop along the way to the cross, the, the Jewish court, the Roman court, and finally the crucifixion itself is a testimony to his love. He gave himself up to it all. Love that is forced is no love at all. Parents can force their children to share, to apologize, and to say that they're sorry to each other. Just because the behavior changes, just because the right words are said, doesn't mean that genuine love has been produced and everyone is full of warm feelings all of a sudden. Governments can force their citizens to give to the poor and support the needy through their taxes. It may be necessary to avert catastrophe or to maintain an orderly society. That does not mean that the uh, rich and the poor have suddenly become dear friends and will be inviting each other over for backyard barbecues and showing up at each other's weddings. No one forced Jesus to go to the cross. Not even the men who arrested him. He gave himself up because he loves us that much. Peter's violent intervention, his uh, attempt to stop Jesus' arrest, could only get in the way of his love. Hands that tried to force Jesus' escape could only be hands of misguided zeal. Jesus was giving himself up because he fully intended to drink the cup of suffering. And Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. At that, Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword away. Am I not to drink 
the cup the Father has given me? Life is a strange mix of good and bad. It doesn't always, or usually, go the way we planned. We may pour our heart and soul into having one kind of life, one kind of career, one kind of family, one kind of lifestyle, and then reality happens. We don't control all the opportunities or experiences that come our way. God chooses to give us something we didn't expect. One way the Bible illustrates this experience is the phrase, drink the cup. It pictures the Lord pouring our experiences into a cup and sliding it across the table for us to drink. Will we take what we are given or will we try to find something else? We are pre-programmed to reject pain, to avoid discomfort. At this moment, my medicine cabinet contains a half dozen products with little health value beyond pain relief. I brush my teeth with a toothpaste that desensitizes them to pain from cold foods or drink. Desensitizing them isn't something that has a real benefit for making them last longer or look look whiter. It simply makes them feel better. It makes me feel less uncomfortable, less pain. Now, there's nothing wrong with relieving the pain we experience in our lives, so long as we can do so without compromising our faith or our morals. But I don't like to drink God's cup when it involves pain I cannot avoid. It's not that Jesus liked pain either, or felt it less deeply than we do. His arrest and trials offended his sense of justice. The the beatings made him sore. The lash of the whip and the thorns piercing his forehead stung and burned. The cross cramped his muscles, cut off his wind, and made him desperate for air like any other crucifixion did. But he intended to drink the cup of his suffering willingly, all for the love of you and me, our salvation, our forgiveness, our eternal future. These things were a greater concern for him than his own comfort. Let the disciples go. Let the future masses be saved. Let his own life be given up. But hands that got in the way of all of this were hands of misplaced zeal. It is in another gospel writer's book, Luke, who tells us that Jesus healed the servant's ear after Peter cut it off. It is the very last miracle Jesus performs before his crucifixion. Jesus' hand touched the man, and he was healed. Jesus' hands have zeal too. Zeal guided by his mercy and by his love. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, have mercy on us, unworthy sinners. We are sorry for the sins we have committed today and those which have filled our past. We know that you've shown us immeasurable kindness in being gracious and forgiving them. Merciful Father, continue to correct and reform what is wrong in us. Help us to grow in grace and knowledge of our Savior Jesus Christ. Write your law in our hearts and equip us to serve you with holy and blameless lives. Bless the preaching of your word and preserve its truth and its gifts to us and all Christians. Turn the hearts of all who trust in their own goodness to trust in the perfect love of Christ and his innocent sacrifice on our behalf Instead, expose our own self-righteous thoughts and attitudes and spare us from their faith-destroying effects. Enable us to see the emptiness of this present age and the darkness in which its people live. Keep us united to Christ by a living faith through the power of your Spirit working through your word and sacrament. 
so deliver us from the eternal misery and death that will come upon those who do not know your grace and love. Guard and protect us from all dangers to body or soul. Give us patience to endure our sorrows cheerfully as you remind us that health and sickness, riches and poverty, all come by the permission of your fatherly hand. Thank you for keeping us through this day and protect us through the night to come. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who's also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. Amen. Our closing hymn this evening is now Rest Beneath Night's Shadow. <laughs> 